PentecostalPastor.com, uh, and with me today is Dr. William Simmons. He is the professor of Old Te uh, New Testament and Greek uh, at uh, Lee University, and it's really a privilege to, to uh, have him. Uh, we've talked about doing several projects, but um, and, and I was like a, I told you when I met in your office yeah. and we were talking about what we wanted to do, I was like a, a kid in a candy uh, uh, store because every idea that you talked about, I'm like, oh, that's so great. Let's do that. Yeah. Then another, oh, that's so great. Let's do that. I wish my students felt that way, actually. <laughs> but go ahead. Keep talking. Well, well uh, uh, Dr. Simmons, we, we, uh, we, we threw around a couple ideas. Um, and uh, hopefully, uh, Lord allows, uh, we'll kind of get to those. But sure. um, we, we kind of started with the idea of the Apostle Paul because it's mm -hmm. so central yeah. to everything that builds out of the New Testament. Not, yeah. not to take, of course, anything away from the sure. Gospels, but yeah. uh, Paul's contribution. Mm -hmm. And when we started talking about that, not only not only was that of interest to me, but it seemed like your eyes lit certainly, up on that. Certainly. Absolutely. So what? T tell me a little bit about what, why that's such a dear project to you. You know, um, I just want to share some about um, the Apostle Paul uh -huh. and uh, his influence on the, on the church and my extension over Western civilization. And I'm going to focus on his epistle to the Romans mm -hmm. and under the title, the, most, the Single Most Important Document Ever Written. Wow. And so... Uh, We'll use that as a, a platform to segue into major themes and I, what I feel is his most important epistle, the epistle to the Romans. Yeah. Now, when we were talking, you said that that not only has uh, consequences for the Christian church, yeah. but you talked about the, the immense historical and cultural implications or consequences, or I, I shouldn't say consequence, I, I guess I should say uh, impact that Certainly. that has had on, on really all of, all of Western civilization, Christendom around the world, actually. Yeah, we'll see as we continue on um, how Paul's epistle to the Romans uh, helped us understand the value of the individual uh -huh. and the, uh, the corporate power of the individual uh, as a community, uh -huh. uh, a sense of justice of what's right and wrong, mm -hmm. a sense of um, every person has a right to be educated, and um, really influencing Western civilization to the point of uh, many of our major values in our culture can be traceable to uh, Paul and can be traceable to his Epistle to the Romans. Yeah. Now you had. I know that you have. Well, I, you have actually, as, as a friend of ours, Mark Barber, we were talking the other day, mm -hmm. and we were talking about some of the background the, in, of the of the New Testament. And he says, "Hey, that's a that's a question for Dr. Bill Simmons." Yeah. He goes, and I said, "Hey, it's just uh, so happens that I have him on uh, coming on to do some projects." Um, you have actually written a book now, leading up to the Apostle Paul. As we mm -hmm. get into this, just so that people know, you're, you have actually written. I saw it on. Uh, you may not put it this way, I know that a lot of times you kind of downplay things, but uh, it was rated um, the, your, the people of the, the peoples of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, I saw it in multiple places rated as one of the, one of the top books available uh, references available for anyone, whether it's Pentecostal. Of course, we're dealing with a lot of Pentecostals and Charismatics, yeah, sure. but it was it wasn't from a Pentecost. It was just from general evangelical mm -hmm. culture that that your uh, reference book uh, has now been actually incorporated into. Right, it's that's correct. Part of the logos deal. Right. So uh, along with all of this, uh, along with the Apostle Paul um, and and your kind of specialty in his writings, mm -hmm. uh, you bring with you a, a rich. Um, uh, 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 study uh, and um, uh, a, a depth of scholarship in all of the happenings and all of the peoples of at, at that particular time. Is that right? For sure. I, I think one of our major responsibilities as exegetes of the New Testament is contextualization. Yeah. We're 2,000 years removed from the original context and um, we need to try to bridge that gap mm -hmm. as much as possible. And the work uh, people groups in the New Testament world uh, the goal is to help us bridge the gap. The writers of the New Testament, they knew their audience. Um, they assumed that their audience would understand what they're talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so when they said Pharisees, they assumed that their audience would know what a Pharisee is or Sadducees or tax collectors. But 2,000 years hence, we don't intuitively really know what those groups meant and how they relate to Jesus in the early church. Right. So the people groups in the New Testament world, uh, the goal was to provide a... A, a nexus of understanding, both social, political, uh, religious, 
for us to enter into that world and then be able then be able to bring the truths of that world through the scripture to our present context. Mm -hmm. And and as you did that, of course, you realize, or as you were as you were, uh, that spilled over, of course, into. Apostle Paul, because of his travels throughout the entire world at that time, it seems like, uh, and um, and and so uh, the when he as he writes this letter, as you're focusing in on, on Romans and and then also Galatians, that's mm -hmm. and, you know trying to bring these together. Yes, uh, um, you're you're bringing a um, you're bringing in the experience of these people, what was going on at the time. And then also able to understand that, hey, listen, we're all people. I mean, the, here's the message then, but this is how it relates to us today. Certainly. I mean, Paul, we, we're, we're talking about getting back into the first century mm -hmm. context. And part of that is understanding the context of the Apostle Paul. Uh -huh. And he was a unique person, uh, a person who was tremendously influenced by Greco-Roman society and culture and literature mm -hmm. and values, at least understanding those values. Right. But also, he was a Jew who was raised in Jerusalem and studied under Gamaliel, one of the greatest rabbis in the first century world. Yeah. So in this one person, his life context draws together the the, the elements of uh, a Greco-Roman world, yeah. but at the same time, a very conservative, he was a Pharisee of the Pharisees, yeah. a very conservative Jewish vision as well. Uh -huh. And in that one person, he is able to communicate cross-culturally the gospel in a very effective way. Uh, and that in turn, of course, uh, spills over to us. And yeah. sometimes with our students, I like to talk about um, authorial intent. That is, when Paul wrote uh, to these churches, uh, he had an intention and he, he had, a, he had a, a desired effect that his writings would have on the recipients. Uh -huh. And he expected them to, to obey that, uh, that message. He expected them to incorporate that message. And part of our sharing here will be that the authorial intent of Paul, that is his intention for that world, it's not limited to those churches, right. it's for us too today. In fact, I, I want to, as we kind of wrap up this introduction, I want to give you a little bit of chance to maybe uh, add anything that, that we may need for the introduction into the mm -hmm. series. Yeah. I just want to point out one of the great uh, benefits that I've had being uh, right here near Lee is getting to know uh, uh, men such as Dr. Simmons and, and uh, uh, we've had others like uh, Terry Cross and, and then Brian Pete, Dr. Peterson yeah. uh, coming on and doing some magnificent work uh, and, and I've had others but I, I will tell you what I really have appreciated about, about your work is um, you talk about Paul uh, in his setting and how it applies today you actually, and, and it seems like it should go without saying these days, but it, but it doesn't. You actually believe the Word of God. Of that course. He, that it was inspired, even though it was written and Paul's personality and his experiences come through. Mm -hmm. This is the inspired, infallible Word of God. And Paul is not just a man of his times. Right. He is a man of his times, but right. through the power of the Holy Spirit, the Word of God is everlasting. And I, I just think that that, unfortunately, that needs to be said. Of course. Uh, I'm totally committed to the word. Yeah, uh, we talked about author, authorial intent, yeah. the author, uh, the intention of the author. But behind the writers of Scripture, there's the author of the Holy Spirit, the inspiration yeah. of the Holy Spirit. That is, the the Spirit um, conveys the clear will of God the Father, mm -hmm. and con conveyed that to the writers of the the Scripture, and and the writers of the Scripture then convey that to us. So, so there is an unbroken chain of, of God's will from where we are to where the, where the Apostle Paul is coming from the Holy Spirit. Yeah. And there's continuity there. We need to maintain that continuity. And, and, and the element that maintains that continuity is faith in the world. Mm -hmm. Faith in what God has communicated to us, to appropriate that, to actualize that, make it real in our lives. And that's what we're going to do as we work through this. Well, I appreciate it. Is there anything else that you want to add before I get out of here and kind of turn it over to you so that uh, they can get all the good stuff? Well, you know, just, <laughs> just you know, you got me talking about the intention of the author and the, and the, uh, the binding validity of the word. I mean, even in the grammar, Paul frequently uses this uh, quotation formula, as they call it. Gigraptai in the Greek uh, means it stands written, and you often read that in his writings. It stands written, and uh, that particular word is in the perfect tense in the in the Greek, which means it was inscripturated at one point, but that that has an an abiding validity under the present moment. The uh -huh. perfect tense means it was written, but that which is written has a binding validity unto this present moment. Yeah. And, and 
of course, Paul was quoting the prophets. It stands written. Yeah. But now his writings stand written. Yeah, absolutely. And his writings have an abiding validity unto this moment. Yeah. And I'm just excited to bring that. Hey, I, well, I'm, I'm excited about it. This is going to be a great study. Uh, appreciate you uh, participating in this with us. And uh, Dr. Simmons, I'm just going to, like I said, I'm going to step back. I'm going to turn it over to you. And, and uh, by the way, we're, we're going to work on some of this equipment stuff in the future. We're going to have you all set up here. Wonderful. But, but uh, for, now, for right now, uh, turn it over to you. Good deal. Thank you very much. Hello, I'm Bill Simmons. I'm professor of New Testament and Greek at Lee University. And over the next few sessions, I'm going to be sharing some of the major themes in Paul's epistle to the Romans. But as an introduction to that, I want to, sh I want to talk uh, a bit uh, underneath the title, The Most Important Single Document in Western Civilization. Now, when you first hear that and say the most important single document in Western civilization, it seems like a uh, really an overstatement. But I'm going to share some, some impact of Paul's Epistle to the Romans, not only in the church, but in civil government, within culture, within the modern missionary movement. And my, the, the theme of all of that I'm sharing is behind these things that we take for granted, uh, it, many of these lead back to Paul's Epistle to the Romans. And so I'm just going to dive in here for a moment and, uh, and, and present this idea. Apart from the Gospels, not to take anything away from the founder of Christianity, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Apart from the Gospels, Romans is perhaps the single most important document in Western civilization. And by extension, a good part of the, of the world in which we live. The, the point I'm making here is that every major theologian, of the post-apostolic church, starting with Augustine and continuing all the way through uh, Karl Barth. I think I could even go uh, as far as our contemporary theologians. For example, James D.G. Dunn, one of the uh, greatest English-speaking theologians on the planet, when he wrote his magnum opus, uh, The Theology of Paul the Apostle, he framed this entire uh, work on Paul's epistle to the Romans. So we can see the, the power of powerful influence up until this very moment. But the point I'm making here is that the Epistle of the Romans, uh, Romans has had a dramatic influence over every major theologian that has formed the church, both then and now. Uh, again, by extension, the impact on major leaders of the church, have uh, that impact has shaped Western Christianity. And by extension, has shaped the social, political, and the church culture of Europe, and as history played out, affected the entire context of America, and then by extension from there, has spread to influence much of the culture of Western civilization here. For example, our notions of individual freedom, our understanding of human dignity, the value of the individual, all of these find their home ultimately in Paul's epistle to the Romans. Uh, many of these notions that I just shared fueled the Renaissance, the rebirth of Greco-Roman um, literature and culture and art. So we have the epistle of the Romans uh, influencing the early church, the major theologians, feeding into the Renaissance here. and, and and as that continued, uh, the value of the individual, the dignity of the individual, the equality of all humanity uh, began to undermine the notion that certain persons and families are more important than others. That is, that is royalty and, and kings. Uh, nation states began to be formed and began to undermine the notion of uh, monarchies. And, and that, that, by extension, started to fuel the notion of the people can rule themselves. This is, this is the heart and soul of democracy here. And so again, backtracking, you know, de democracy, uh, the formation of the nation states, the undermining of monarchy, the dignity of the individual, uh, the epistle of the Romans speaking about uh, God's care for us and, and, and our accountability to God morally and spiritually. All of that begins to interconnect and, and take on uh, a momentum that just keeps going and keeps traveling here. 
Um, let me trace some of these thoughts out in particular. Uh, all of these ideas began to um, coalesce, they began to gel in, um, in the heart of one of the, the greatest churchmen of all time, Martin Luther, the father of um, the Protestant Reformation here. Uh, indeed, every single church, apart from the Roman Catholic Church and the Eastern Orthodox Church, every single other church uh, owes its existence to the Reformation. And as I said, Martin Luther, the father of the Reformation, was profoundly influenced by Paul's Epistle to the Romans. So, so now we have this link between Paul's Epistle to the Romans, Martin Luther, the Reformation, and the birth of Protestantism. And then those of you who know something about uh, church history uh, realize the, the exponential effect of the birth of Protestantism, uh, not only on the church, but, uh, but upon all of Western civilization. The social and cultural reforms that, that have, have sprung forth from Protestantism uh, and, and the Protestant church um, are incalculable. And um, so again, the most single uh, important uh, document in Western civilization, if you just simply took it up to uh, Martin Luther and the Protestant Reformation, I think you could make a case that the expansive ramifications of the Protestant Reformation, again, finding its influence through Romans uh, is, is beyond measure. Uh, again, the notion that the individual is justified by faith alone and personally accountable to God uh, instilled the idea of personal holiness. In other words, we have to live for God uh, for ourselves. We, we, can't, we, can't, um, we can't access the spiritual success of other persons. We can't, we can't look to another individual to secure our relationship with God. We have to answer to God directly and individually. And so that affects the way that I live, and that affects the way that I relate to people, and that affects the way that I work. All of this, again, starts funneling in to the doctrines and principles that we see in um, the epistle to the Romans here. A sense of vocation. If I'm answerable to God individually, then, then I'm here for a reason. God has me here for a reason. Uh, what is my vocation? What does he want me to do? Uh, and when I understand uh, what God wants me to do, uh, that must mean I need to do it as unto the Lord. Uh, that is, what God wants me to do affects my work ethic. Of, of, of how I spend my time and how I do my job. Uh, if I'm individually accountable to God and I'm justified by faith, by my personal relationship with God in Christ, that starts to affect my sense of justice, of what's right and wrong and what's fair and unfair. And, 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 and my relationship to my neighbor with regard to what's, what's right and wrong. And so that starts to spill over to the, uh, the idea of, of civil law and started uh, influencing the justice system. And we're going to go on with this, but uh, it's no accident that in most uh, courts in the West, before you testify, they have you lay your hand on the Bible. What they're saying is this is the touchstone for what's true and false, what's right and wrong, what's fair and unfair, and, and it doesn't matter who, who's on trial whether they're uh, a king or whether they're uh, a civil leader or whether they're very wealthy, it doesn't matter because this Bible says that we're all created in the image of God and we're all the same and we're all accountable to the same standard. Guess where a lot of that starts? <laughs> yeah, I guess you know by now. Where all of that finds its birthplace in, in a consolidated way? Paul's epistle to the Romans. And so that's why I'm calling it the single most important document in Western civilization here. The early persecution of the Protestants. We talked about the birth of the Protestants due to Martin Luther and the great influence of uh, Romans on his life. Uh, the persecution of the Protestants, uh, particularly in England, led to an exodus to the New World. And pilgrims came seeking religious freedom. They wanted, they wanted the freedom to worship God 
as they felt God was leading them to worship. And they left England as pilgrims, and they came to the New World, and as soon as they got here, what did they do? They began to establish communities and churches based upon their vision of, of uh, faith in Christ. And much of that, again, was informed and fueled by Paul's epistle to the Romans. So, so now we have a, a, a sea change of the understanding of the self and the understanding of the church going through Romans, and now we have crossing the sea. Uh, establishing communities and churches based on the Epistle of the Romans. Here again, the holiness movements, as you continue on in what came to be known as the United States here, the holiness movements swept across early America and eventually birthed the modern missionary movements. And the modern missionary movements sensed the mandate to take the gospel internationally and globally. And, you know, what, you know the, the connecting links here is that the gospel is to pre be preached to the whole world. And what is that gospel? We're justified by faith alone, faith in Christ. We're saved by grace alone. And guess where that comes from? That comes from the Epistle of the Romans. So now we have a global outreach here uh, and, and the effect of that on those cultures as well. Uh, perhaps coming closer to home, the dynamic growth of the Pentecostal movement sparked renewal movements in the Roman Catholic Church. We're starting to come full circle. We're starting to come full circle here, uh, where the Epistle of the Romans effect on our early churchmen, Martin Luther, the Protestant Reformation, the undermining of the monarchies, the idea of democracy, uh, the creation of the nation states, the, the search for religious freedom. We have the colonization of America. We have the holiness movements, the modern missionary movements, and then we have the Pentecostal revival happening and then we have the charismatic renewal starts to influence the Roman, the Roman Catholic Church and many other churches here. Um, behind it all as a seed that grows into something that's far beyond its initial qualities uh, is the Epistle to the Romans here. Um, presently ideas uh, about marriage and the family I think we know the turmoil that we're in right now in our particular culture, the gay agenda, uh, the legitimacy of the modern uh, state of Israel, um, issues concerning abortion, capital punishment, and even the traditional understanding of hell. If all of these contemporary issues, before the sun sets on a discussion of these really hot topics, at some point, someone's going to start quoting from the Epistle of the Romans. It's going to come in. It's as if no, no issue of substance can escape the, the orbit of this great work. Not for long. It's going to come up. The point is that the spiritual and conceptual payload of Romans weighs heavy on the mind of Western culture, and before the, the, before the day is over, Someone's going to say something about Paul, and when they start that, they're going to talk about Romans. So what's the conclusion? If a person doesn't have a substantial grasp of the content and the ideas of Romans, there's a huge gap in their understanding of Western civilization and the history of the church.